I think we can all agree that sexual intimacy is something that's really important to all of us. And sometimes you may not be feeling the confidence in the bedroom that, well, you feel like you should. This is where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is an online prescription service that delivers the same key ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but without having to visit a doctor, wait at the pharmacy, or anything in person. So if you want to up your sex life, give Blue Chew a try. Use code HOLLY at checkout when you go to bluechew.com and get your first order for free. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. My guest today has been in the industry for over 16 years. She started shooting scenes pretty soon after she turned the age of 18. I've had the privilege of working with her many times, and she's actually one of my most highly requested guests. So I know everybody's so excited that I finally got her on the show. I'm, of course, talking about the one and only Natasha Nice. What? Hi. Everyone, so good to be here. How are? Yes, and it's so nice to see you too. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Um, and and truly, people are like, I've had a lot of requests for you. And then when I told my Patreon members that uh, you were coming on the show, everybody was like, I got a lot. Sometimes I get like no questions for my guests. Sometimes I get a couple. I got so many for you. I was like, holy shit. Aww. So like everybody's very excited to have you here. <laughs> Do you have a, like a sense of your success, by the way? Like, or does it surprise you like that you're quite popular? Um. Yeah, it does. It does surprise me. I feel like I'm constantly trying to find the meaning of my like fame or status and you know what it means to like the fans and the different markets and the industry as well and because to me it's just kind of like a you know a day in the life of myself you know so I forget mm -hmm. to see the, the bird's eye view the perspective of the the rest of the world so it's it does still shock me sometimes I'm like oh I'm on the front page of Pornhub porn stars that's so exciting and like my friends yeah. like Remind me of that my neighbors like to remind me of that um <laughs> you know but I I know that I'm a normal person I watch a lot of Netflix and things like that so it's just like I like little reminders here and there that I'm like a big deal do you have a hard time kind of like separating your work life from your personal life or when you come home are you like your regular self do you know what I'm saying like do you have a lot of because I know that you don't live like in kind of LA proper. Um, so maybe do you feel like you have like a little bit of distance from the industry? Um, I, I feel like I'm pretty much always myself and I did start at 18. So like I, I am Natasha nice. Um, so it's not necessarily that I like become a different person when I get home. I just you know, but like I put on sweats and I watch TV, like and I very much mm -hmm. enjoy doing that. And that's not as exciting as the things I do on my social media or in videos. So I, it's just a different side of me. Yeah. yeah. But it's all like the complete Natasha nice package. Like you can be a, a sexual person as well as somebody who likes to watch Netflix and sweats. Yeah, well, I debate with, with myself whether or not I should, like, show a realer side to myself, but I'm just afraid that be because people make, like, such cool videos for social media, I'm worried people are going to think I'm boring. Um, and then people that are close to me are like, no, that's not boring, that's interesting. And I'm like, okay, well, I, you know, it, I haven't, I've been doing okay presenting myself as is so far, so I guess I don't really need to change it, but... I would sometimes like to just tweet the the random nothings of my day, but I just always decide not to. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I see people who are constantly on social media, like pictures of them at dinner, it's like so cool. what they made for lunch. And I'm just like, wow, I just feel I just can't get into that because I just feel like like it's my life is general, really not that interested in people like don't care. But I don't know, some people do. 
I think they really do. Like, honestly, uh, if, like, Leonardo DiCaprio, who I don't follow for whatever reason, but if he posted a vlog of what he did in his day and it was just watching TV and ordering DoorDash, I would totally watch that. But, you know, when I think of me doing it and, like, giving it to people who are potentially paying for my content, I'm like, no, they don't need to know the three times you ordered Uber Eats, you know? (laughs) (laughs) So So you mentioned getting in to you mentioned getting into the industry at 18. Um, so tell us about that. What's your origin story? How did Natasha Nice become Natasha Nice? And what was it like getting in the industry so early? Um, how did Natasha Nice become Natasha Nice? So the backstory there is that I wasn't really allowed to go out much as a teenager and like um, hang out or party or anything. Went to a small high school and I kind of just started like going for walks around where I lived and I ran into all the boys there and we would play basketball or whatever. But I had a, I guess what you could call a late start with when it comes to sex. But then when I turned 18, I had already been sending nude photos to all the boys that I liked anyways. So I kind of just developed naturally that I should go online and find a way to make money off of nude pictures. Um, So we had this really weird digital camera. It was like purple. Anyways, and um, yeah, so it kind of just started there. And then I like went on Sexy Jobs and I went on Google and typed in how to become a porn star. Oh my God, Sexy Jobs. You are taking me back, girl. I mean, so (laughs) I go on xbiz.com and I see an ad for Sexy Jobs and I'm like, that works. Like, (laughs) I went there. (laughs) So yeah, Wait, that is still exists. Sexy jobs does. It does. Really? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess. Okay. So, so you went on sexy jobs and what happened from there? Um, and then I got like a solo here and another solo there. And then an agent contacted me and I already knew from the solos that it was a pretty lucrative situation. So I uh, signed with an agent and he just, they just started booking me. Like I, I think I started out for, as girl, girl only for a couple months and they were booking me a good amount, but then they were like, you know, we, we could get you so much more work. And by then my feet had already been dipped in the water and everything. And so I kind of asked my boyfriend at the time that was cool. And he just kind of rolled his eyes and was like, yeah, sure. Whatever you want. And, um, <laughs> and we actually lasted four years, believe it or not. But I was going to ask you because I feel like that's a pretty big decision. I mean, obviously not only for you, but for your significant other to decide to share you with other people if you guys like weren't in the lifestyle at all. Yeah, I think I had a gut instinct at that moment that that would eventually end the relationship. And that is ultimately what happened. But I was maybe partially naive and partially more interested in doing yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get you were also like, you were 18 and you had the whole world ahead of you. Yeah. And I just really wanted to like be more of a sexual creature and less of like a mm-hmm. dorky, you know, scholastic creature. Is that what you were growing up? You were like a dorky kind of smart, nerdy kid? Mm, I was a lot of things. I was dorky in the sense that like people laughed at me, but I was kind of chubby too. But I also was friends with all the different cliques. So I I don't know if you could call me like a traditional dork or nerd or whatever. Like I kind of just bounced around the whole school and made friends with everyone. And then I was student body president and then I like played basketball and volleyball, but I never really had like a tight knit group of friends. Um, Mm -hmm. I was kind of like awkward. I was like the one low income kid in this private French school. And I I think that maybe had something to do with it. I don't know. Looking back, I was just a little bit weirder than I am. now. <laughs> yeah. So what was your first, I guess, tell me about your first solo scene first. Like, I want to know like what the very first time that you did anything adult related was. Do you remember who it was for? Uh, the very, very first one, which I never saw anywhere on the internet. It was off of the 101 at like this hotel. I can't remember what it was called, but I see it every time I drive on the 101. It's like in Van Nuys area Van Nuys 
or even Balboa area. And it, he paid me two grand just to watch me masturbate. My boyfriend waited in the car in the parking lot. I went in, I masturbated. I don't think I did any paperwork. Uh, he paid me and then I left. So I would think it was like a personal collection kind of thing. Yeah, thank yeah. <laughs> oh God. Were you nervous? I mean, I guess your boyfriend was in the car, so he was a scream away, but. Sure. I think I just have always had really big balls when it comes to doing things. And mm. I, I knew that, I guess I knew that he wasn't like, I must've figured he was a pervert, but like, I'm a pervert too. And I know I wouldn't hurt yeah. anyone. So it wasn't that much yeah. of an issue. Um, I think it was just like two grand. <laughs> That's like where my head was at. That's a but lot. Flags, you know? So I yeah. guess I wasn't that, that nervous. Right. Okay. So then tell me about your first like sex scene. So you were doing girl, girl at first. So it was with another girl, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember my first girl, girl. Um, I was probably pretty nervous. Uh, I mean, I hadn't been with a girl at that point. So my first girl, girl experience was on camera. Most of them have been. Um, but yeah, I don't fucking remember who it was with. I know that I had a huge crush on Rebecca Linares and she was a model of the agent who signed me. And she just comes uh, out of the agency one day as I'm coming out of my car to go inside. And I'm like, Oh my God, I have seen you on the hun.com so many times. And, um, which was like the porn hub of the day or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, she like gave me a kiss on the lips and then she like kept going. She didn't speak very good. She was awesome. That girl was really, really great and a great performer. Really good performer. Um, I liked Rebecca a lot. I worked with, I worked with her a few times. She was, she was really cool. I wonder what happened to her. Okay. So, so you start doing girl, girl. Um, how are you feeling about adult at this point? Are you thinking like, this is like a, a good career choice for me? This is, or were you just kind of just taking each job, not really thinking about, do you have longevity here? I think for me at that time, especially in the beginning, it was more just like, I needed to relax. I had just come out of like two years of pretty intense, like pre preparations for these exit exams in high school. And it was just a lot. It was in French and I was still more, mostly a, an English speaker. So it was just a lot. And I just needed to like, chill and then you know coming into my body as a young woman so porn was just kind of a solution for a lot of pressures I was dealing with at the time and then um I don't know if I really like I didn't really like hunker down and structure my career until after my break in 2012 and then I came back and then I started being more mature about it but before then I was just kind of um I was just kind of just one dick at a time I guess yeah yeah, no, I understand. Um, okay, so tell me about your first boy-girl scene. Do you remember that one? I will always remember that. It was with John Strong for Red Light District. And oh, my God. It's so old school. I know. <laughs> and it was very, like, it was it was a gonzo scene. And, you know, they, like, he followed my ass around the swimming pool. And I was wearing these shoes I'd never worn before, but they were stripper heels, so they were comfortable um wearing like an outfit I'd never really worn before and I'm just like sitting on the couch and in my mentality I'm like just be confident you know and so he's asking <laughs> me all these questions and he's kind of looking for like the inner whore in me and I'm just like answering as like confident 18 year old and so <laughs> and I rewatched it recently and I was like all right you go you go 18 year old me but I just I feel like I've gotten way better it was I was kind of like watching with one eye open. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's so funny. I remember those scenarios and I remember those questions. And back then I was working, you know, for my parents, for Suzanette and my dad like wanted to shoot more gonzo style stuff like that. Cause that was not our, our style at all. And it's so funny. Cause I look back on that and I'm like, and we ended up sticking with our style, but we should have really just stuck to what we were good at. Yeah. Um, and so my dad would try to get me to ask those questions and I am not good at that. I mean, you can almost like kind of tell from my podcast, like I don't really go in there with like, how many dicks have you taken in your ass? You know what I mean? Like, that's just not who I am. Yeah. 
So I, yeah, I remember him trying to get me to do these like interviews and it was just so uncomfortable for me. I like, I can't, I can't be that person who asks those questions. Is that where your interviewing kind of skill came from? Is, is uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know if I have an interviewing skill. I think I've, so I think I've developed it. It's gotten better for sure. I've been doing this show for like over five years. At the beginning, I wasn't, I was not, I mean, I, again, I still don't think I'm very good, but I wasn't very good at the beginning. I was definitely not good at the beginning. I would interrupt people a lot um, because I was like so excited. I treated it more like a conversation, I think, than I did like an interview, which podcasts really are. But, mm-hmm. you know, I got a lot of comments of like, Holly, we don't care about what you have to say. Yeah. We want to listen to your guest. I'm like, mm, but I'm interesting too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've gotten better at that, I think. But um, I don't know. I just think I like naturally like to talk to people and I feel comfortable with most of my guests because I know them, you know, you and I worked together a few times, so it doesn't feel like too weird. Yeah. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. Um, Okay. So, so you said that you'll always remember that scene. Was there anything specific in that scene that was memorable or just kind of all the things you already talked about? Um, I think it was just, well, the fact that it was John Strong and John Strong is still like a dope ass performer nowadays just kind of makes me feel like a little bit more legendary because, Mm. you know, it just makes me feel like one of the more old school porn stars and who doesn't love an old school porn star? I know, I know, right? We are, we are veterans. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, just the sex in general was very like fast paced. And so, I don't know, maybe the athlete in me really enjoyed that. <laughs> mm, the volleyball player? I guess so. Basketball player? I yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, my G-spot had not been stimulated like that before, you know, by the little boys in my neighborhood. So right. that was a taste of something new. Yeah. So what do you think about the fact that you got into porn at the age of 18? And this is, like, always a controversial question people have a lot of different opinions on it um but how do you feel about it do you think it's good that you got in at 18 in hindsight do you wish you had waited do you think that's an okay age for people to get in what what do you think about that hmm had i waited i probably would have succumbed to the norm and just gone off to college and i don't know if i would want to risk what i have now for that possibility but mm-hmm. at the time I was nowhere near as mature and developed at 18 as I am now um like I mean I was the girl who was like losing her phone every time she went out kind of thing so I worry sometimes for the 18 year olds in this business I'm like I had a math teacher who used to say stay away from drugs as long as you can and I think that when I see some of these girls because they look like really young or whatever and I know that they're doing what I was doing back then so Um, yeah, it does, I guess I think about it, but I don't think that that's ever going to happen. Like that's the last No. Well, and yeah, I mean, that's a thing. And if the government has decided that at the age of 18, you're an adult, then you are allowed to do adult things, whether or not one thinks you're fully developed mentally. 21. That's subjective. 21, I feel like, or even 20. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why it needs to be 18. I mean, I'm so not, I don't know. I hear you. I hear you. But yeah, I just think again, it's like that question of, okay, I mean, literally like the government, like people, not uh, not us have decided that the age of 18, you can go to war, you can, you know, vote, you can do all of these things, you know, um, I guess you can do porn. I wonder if it has to do with like, the ownership of your own body like if it's from that mm-hmm. angle like you can't tell mm-hmm. someone to do with their own body past the age of 18 yeah yeah i mean the age of cons well the age of consent right is 18 yeah. um but then like why can you not drink until you're 21 that's kind of also an interesting question i don't know maybe there's it's- enough data to show that <laughs> people drink and drive when they're under 21 I don't know this stat. but they do it over 21 a lot too and yeah. into their 30s and I don't know yeah I don't know it's a it's a complicated question but it's, in the end it worked out for you yeah I mean it worked out but I did need to take a long ass break 
I mean, at 24, I was even in a pretty good place um, professionally. I think I was like starting to get some really good noms um, and like some really good, you know, movies and things like that. And then I just kind of was like, I need to, you know, go back to school or do something normal. Like this is too much um, chaos for me right now. So I just kind of bolted. Yeah. Yeah. And so what did you do during your break? Did you, did you go back to school? I did. I went back to school. I kind of like tampered in a few things. I did international business. I did marine biology. Um, But then I realized marine biology wouldn't pay very well. And I like money. So I decided to demote that into a hobby. And then I pursued computer science. And that's where I thought I was going to end up. But after a couple of years of that, it was monotonous. It was yeah. it did not satisfy the inner, you know, performer wildebeest inside of me. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. My brother is a computer programmer and I'm just like bored to tears with his, I don't even have, it's not like he talks about his job that much, but I'm like, how, how do you just do code all day? Like it's kill me now. The programmers that I met, they were interesting. Like they had really, uh, they had a great sense of humor. I liked going out to lunch with them. Like I really enjoyed being around them. But doing the programming and learning from a teacher who doesn't really want to teach, um, that was kind of like a bummer. You know, it's reminded me so much of that commercial, you know, that I I don't know what his name is, but he's like, for sore eyes, use (laughs) eyes. Oh, oh my God. Wait, the guy from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Bueller. Bueller. (laughs) that guy with the monotone voice yeah the sound of his voice was like the theme song to my computer science years it just (laughs) got so boring so fast (laughs) oh my god oh my god that's funny all right guys we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back and hear more from natasha so stick around we'll be back in one minute Look guys, let's talk about performance issues in the bedroom. If you're struggling with this, this is not anything that you should be ashamed of. I see this all the time in my line of work. However, there is something that you can do about it. Look guys, I know you probably don't love going to the doctor and having to sit there face to face with him and tell him about all of your little problems with your friend down there. This is why Blue Chew is such a great alternative. Blue Chew is an online prescription service where you can consult with their licensed medical providers who will help you find the right prescription just for you. They deliver chewable tablets with the same ingredients as Viagra and Cialis for a fraction of the cost. I mean, personally, I'm the kind of girl who swallows, but if you're the type of guy who doesn't swallow pills, of course, you're going to love Blue Chew because their tablets are chewable. So if you could use a little bit of extra confidence in the bedroom, you should give Blue Chew a try. Go to bluechew.com and use code HOLLY and get your first order for free. Only pay $5 in shipping. Hey guys, we are back. Okay, so Natasha, while you were on a break from the industry, did you find that people like knew that you'd been in the adult industry and was there like a stigma from that career path that followed you at all? Um, I kind of felt like just being a porn star, we have a different vibe that people outside of porn are just not used to. And I think a lot of people, like, it just made them uncomfortable. Um, So, yeah, I did feel that way. And it kind of, like, it really kind of, like, bummed me out for a while. But I kind of just decided that, like, I wouldn't let it make me mad anymore. And I would just put that to rest and just try and, like, be the change I wanted to see or whatever. And, like, just remember that, like, I'm a valid worthy human being just as is whether I'm a porn star or not and then just kind of like live my life in accordance with that and not let the negativity get to me but also um still find ways to like be out you know but it's also important to me as a porn star to not be like offensive in public that's just something like yeah when I'm with family I don't talk about anything like that I would like to but I don't um, but when they piss me off, I will occasionally get a little bit more vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the fight. You see, you gotta fight it a little bit. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so so you came back from your break. What were 
when was that? And what were like some of the biggest changes that you noticed when you came back? Um, I think, oh my gosh. Uh, when I came back, there was just, it was just bigger. Like the industry was bigger. There was, there were more companies I'd never heard of before, more directors, obviously a new, you know, gang of girls and everything. And so I kind of was just like caught in a little bit of a tornado, just kind of looking around and, um, figuring out what was what. And, um, but at the time I was living in San Francisco. So I, I think my way of like keeping it simple was to just stick to what I knew, which was webcamming. And then that's right around the time when OnlyFans came about. And that was very simple, at least in the beginning. So I kind of just stuck with those two things while I also was keeping another eye on the industry and like maybe where I wanted to go with it. Mm. You were actually one of the early adopters of OnlyFans. Um, did you have faith that the platform was going to end up being as profitable as it has been? Um, cause I gotta say, like, I remember when OnlyFans first came along, I joined it just because I didn't want anyone else to take my name, yeah. but I was like, this site ain't going to go anywhere. This is some janky ass shit. And I was very wrong about that. <laughs> so how did you feel? Like, did you, did you see potential where other people did not? I think somebody told me at one point that because myself, Asa, Kira and Sophie D were like some of the first girls to venture onto OnlyFans. And Somebody told me that Asa Kira had her notifications on for every time she had a new subscriber, and that yes, that oh my day, god, it was so annoying. And that that day they had like eight, she had like eight hundred or something things going on. So right from the get go, I knew that OnlyFans could potentially be a big deal, but I didn't know if it was going to be for me because I had been gone for so long, etc. Um, but I saw that it was just like easy to use. And, you know, prior to leaving for a break, I had NatashaNice.com, which was operated by Puba. And it was just such a an uh, older, you know, kind of website structure that there's like a million distractions on the screen. And, and then it asks you like, hey, do you want to subscribe? And so it was just harder to manage. And then OnlyFans is just like, do you like these tits? Subscribe now, you know? <laughs> This simple. Let's keep it simple, people. Keep it really simple, which I didn't have the foresight or the knowledge to be like, oh, this is going to be big. But mm -hmm. I just made it, and then like sometime later, I opened it, and I had a nice paycheck in there, and I hadn't done shit with it. I hadn't even been promoting it, so I was like, okay, this this could be good, you know. And especially because I was yeah. in LA, so I had no other ventures going on when I was home. Yeah. You still actually shoot for studios. Um, so what is it about like mainstream porn that keeps you coming back when so many performers are now only shooting their own content? I'm afraid of the legal landscape of content creation. I just feel like because of what Pornhub is going through and just what all the content creation sites are going through, having to prove legitimacy and age verification that, you know, any day now they could take it down forever or for a while. And I don't want, um, I don't want to be kind of left in that situation where I have a shit ton of money that I can no longer re rely on. So I think I'm just scared. <laughs> so I, I stick with mainstream porn cause it's a little safer. It's like diversifying portfolio, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. And look, like, I mean, I think there's, there's a difference between scared and just like, being wise and being prepared and not putting all of your eggs in one basket, which I think is something that smart people do because you're right. I mean, we've already seen this, right? We saw, was it last year or was it the year before? I'm like losing track of time where OnlyFans did for like a week go, like we're kicking all the sex, wor sex workers off the platform. And then everyone freaked out and they're like, yeah. Oh, just kidding. We're going to lose all our money. And then they came back. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, I mean, you're right. Like you never know what's going to happen. And there's definitely a lot of chatter about Visa and MasterCard and their regulations and becoming more and more strict. And then also, I mean, you know, working for the bigger brands does keep your name out there. And I would imagine helps like garner new fans and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does. It's, I don't know. It must be different for different groups of men, different groups of viewers, because sometimes I'll hop on my webcam and like 20 dudes are like, 
are you still performing? And I'm like, dude, I have like four new scenes out right now. Like, are they not being, you know, circulated through the internet? So um, I don't know how much it keeps my name out there. I've kind of had my eye on like some girls who retired a while ago and I see how long it takes for them to drop down into the rankings when they're uh, a big deal. And it takes a while. So I think like years, 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 like eight, nine, 10 years. Um, so I think that if I wanted to quit mainstream, I could, I wouldn't suffer right away. I definitely have time to bounce into something new. Um, but it's just kind of like what I know. And I think a part of me just really wants like MILF performer of the year. <laughs> just oh. uh, you know, it's, it's um, kind of vain, but um, I don't know. I like owe it to myself to go for it. Yeah. And do you, do you like being on production sets? Like, you know, working with a bunch of other people or do you prefer, some people prefer to just, they love shooting at home in their bedroom with their camera. And some people like really like to be on set and like to be around people and like that social aspect. No, to be honest, I love being alone most of the time, but I, I, (laughs) I put in the work necessary for mainstream productions. Just, I just can't, I can't even explain it. I just can't let it go. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Safety net for sure. I guess. Yeah. You said that porn has been a good teacher of self care for you. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, yeah. So like after I took a break and then came back and I started like taking my job more seriously, I went and I saw some old scenes and I was like, why didn't I have like my nails done? Why didn't I, you know, drink more water, whatever. And so I kind of just started to step my game up. And in order to step your game up, you have to take care of your body. You have to take care of your, you know, mind, your skin and everything. And so it kind of just tuned me to how to take care of myself. And that was really attractive for me because, like, I had a mom who, like, was so disgusted when I got my period and was so disgusted whenever I would show like a small amount of cleavage like that that much she'd be like pull your shirt up so um I wasn't really taught how to like take care of my body I kind of just thought you wiped front to back or back to front (laughs) which isn't the case it's the other way around so um (laughs) so I think just like that's that's like the first way that porn really became super empowering is that it just taught me to like take care of myself yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there, you learn a lot about your body when you do adult work because you have to, right? Because in order yeah. to have, sorry, you just like learn how to feel like all the square inches of your body and the different mm-hmm. le- levels of depth inside your body, you know? Yeah. And how to take care of your, I mean, you know, I know some girls have, you know, if you work a lot, sometimes you'll have like issues you know, with infections or like pH levels. So it's kind of, I've learned so much about like just maintaining, you know, cleanliness and hygiene from the adult industry. Like, you know, people always say dumb shit like, oh, porn stars are like disgusting and dirty. I'm like, they're actually literally like the cleanest people (laughs) who will ever have sex with. I hate to compare us, but it's not, it's like, you know how you think a dog's mouth is dirty, but really it's like the a super clean mouth. It's like, yeah, yeah just, they don't, those people don't know what they're talking about, nor do they want to. Um, but yeah. I think what it really taught me was like, you know, if you eat a lot of salt the night before, you're going to have a hard time waking up. If you drink a lot of water, you just move, you know, more lubricated. Mm-hmm. You know? So just things about like how to care, like holistically. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think um, some of the biggest misconceptions people have about the adult industry? Um, oh, jeez. Um, I th- that they do know it. They seem to think that they know it, but they know they don't. It's really weird. Um, mm-hmm. And then they like come up with these crazy drama you know, dramatizations of what our lives must have been like and what they're like now. And it's really weird. It's like a delusion. Um, They're just processing their own sexual issues 
by watching our lives be fine. Um, yeah, I try not to think about them anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. There's a lot of projection going on. I think the people that are like the angriest about porn are the people that have the most, are the most confused about their own sexual hangups, you know? Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if like part of my purpose in life is to help them, but I have no idea how to do that because it is a projection. And usually the way you help someone with that is kind of by being an asshole to them (laughs) and then they respect Mm -hmm. you. But I don't, I don't know. Maybe when I'm old, I'll figure it out. (laughs) Well, I think it's one of those things, right, where, like, people can't be helped. It's like with addicts. Like, people can't be helped unless they want to. Right. So you're not going to convince – you're probably not going to convince some guy on Twitter that is, like, sure that you're being sex trafficked and you had, like, a horrible childhood. Um, if that's what he wants to believe, it's like no matter what you say, you probably won't convince him otherwise. But, you know, there's a lot of people that come into it. I get a lot of response from people who watch this podcast who say, like, you know, I thought the adult industry was different. And then I watched a show and I listened to all of these people talk about their lives. And now I feel very differently about it. But I think those are people that it probably came in with, you know, they were willing to be open-minded about stuff. Yeah. Some people, yeah. whereas yeah. some people don't want to change their mind about anything. There are people who are like on the fence about porn and they know that they don't know us. So they're willing to listen but there might be a couple things that they're like, well, what about the children or whatever? And they're, that's yeah. their stance. But then there's people on the other side of the fence and they're like, no, we hate porn, no negotiations. And they're just like, why would I even argue with them? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a waste. Don't waste your time. Yeah, it's just a waste of my time. If they attack me, then, then I have to. But like, um, I try to just think about the people on the fence and that's like the world that's safer to like live in. Yeah. Because if I only think about like the Christians or the NCOC types of people (laughs) out there, I'm just going to be so sad and feel so discouraged. And I have to remember that there are actually a lot of people out there who are either allies or semi allies, you know, who are like, you know, especially nowadays, I think girls are becoming more okay with it. Yeah. And I find I have to remind myself often that especially when it comes to social media, the people who like scream the loudest are the ones that you see, but you have to remember that they don't represent the majority of people. Most people literally aren't going to say anything on social media. Like they'll process things themselves and they'll think a certain way. And, um, but the ones that are like very anti-porn, like will make themselves very loud. But one has to remember they do not represent like generally the majority of people, but it just appears that way because they're so noisy. There's like a quote about that from someone and it's like, the problem with most people is that those who are smart think they're dumb and those who are dumb think they're smart. But basically the quiet ones are quiet because they're thinking. (laughs) They're using their thought and the other ones who aren't thinking are using their mouth. So, yes. So much bullshit. God. Good Lord. Yeah. That is, ab- that is, that is so true. I've, that's a really good way to put it. Um, yes, man. So much yes on that one. Absolutely. Okay. Um, my last question for you here. Uh, what has been the most rewarding aspect of your career? Um, <laughs> um, kind of saying fuck you to the misogynistic culture we live in Mm -hmm. (laughs) I guess both men and women are guilty of it I don't know just being like no no I belong to me this is my life I do what I want with it and it has caused me a lot of problems with people but it is just so worth it because at the end of the day I know I belong to myself not some like you know entity or system and like I still have to you know, kiss certain people's asses, but it just is what it is. You know what I mean? I don't like, um, I don't know. I don't feel like I owe anybody anything. And that's really like just the shit. Yeah. Do you think that the financial independence that you've gained, I would assume in the last few years, like everybody else has with platforms like OnlyFans has, has helped you in that aspect? Cause you don't, I mean, literally now, like you know, I mean, one thing that 
I think you can say that money does tend to bring is a sense of freedom and independence. I think it's been a double-edged sword um, because it does create problems um, uh, in a sense where you're just part of a different class and then they kind of look at you like you're an asshole and that's always a bummer to me because I know that I'm not but um I think yeah in a sense like when I need to escape from shit I can just go to Costa Rica or I can just go to fucking Kazakhstan like I can just go wherever the fuck I want uh, I yeah I don't actually know if you can travel to Kazakhstan but I can just yeah I was like that's a very random and very different <laughs> place than Costa Rica <laughs> map right here and it's big so i can go to brazil like <laughs> i just mean like i i can like check out i can go like okay yes fuck, i'm going to big bear i'm gonna go learn learn how to snowboard i'm gonna go snorkel with some dolphins like there's so much beauty in the world that i get to access because yeah i do have the money to do so um it's just the human connection part that really takes a hit um as a result of my job and that's just the part that, like, I refuse to give up on, but sometimes I do anyways. Yeah, I hear you. I would imagine that dating can it probably presents its difficulties. Just with anyone, honestly, like friendship, um, just like anyone. I think when you're, like, a strong, confident, independent slut, you just have a certain aura about you, and people find that very obnoxious or intimidating or something. And I just yeah. can't spend my time trying to figure out what that is because I have to live my life. So right. it's all right. It'll make sense one day. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if you continue to be authentic to yourself, like the universe has a way of bringing like the right people in your life. But sometimes it takes a minute, you know? We don't get to decide when that happens. No, we just have to be open to it, which is hard when you want to just watch Netflix, but it'll happen when it's supposed to happen. <laughs> you will find yourself the perfect man who also just wants to watch Netflix. Yeah. Yes. Please be old. <laughs> like fifty. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's that's like a good age. God, long white hair, maybe like a red plaid button down. Okay, well. okay, we have a very specific <laughs> idea of who we're in, who we're into. I like it. Yeah, I'm gonna help. I'm gonna manifest that for you. Thank you. Guy with long white hair and a plaid button down shirt. Thank you. <laughs> the horse would be fine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think you should be afraid to ask for what you yeah. want, Natasha. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for answering all my questions. Um, everybody, we are going to do a bonus Q and a with her. My Patreon members sent me a bunch of questions for her. So we are going to do that, but that's going to be in a separate um, video that you can only access on my Patreon. So for now, Natasha, can you just tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Yeah, on Twitter, my Twitter is um, forward slash B E nice Natasha. So like the word B nice Natasha. That is the only one. It is verified. Um, and then on that's my social media. Um, uh, you can also find me at onlyfans.com forward slash be nice Natasha. Perfect. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And miraculously, I'm still on TikTok. Um, Holly Randall unfiltered. For all of my links to all of my platforms, just go to hollylinks.com. It's the easiest way. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch this Q&A that we're going to do, go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.